Virtual Book Signing. I'm Daniel Weinberg, and as always, we're here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop in Chicago. Uh, if you're watching in the archive, we'll probably have uh, signed books still available if you get us early enough. Uh, they do tend to go. And of course, again, those of you who are watching, if you want a signed or inscribed book, uh, let us know while we're going here, and we'll, we'll get it done, or even afterward if you need to. We do have a number of people here in the, in the shop. We appreciate you coming out on a Friday evening uh, to be with us. Today, uh, we have Richard Slotkin, Emeritus Professor at Wesleyan University and the author of a number of books ahead of this. His novel, Abe, won the Michael Schauer Award for Civil War Fiction and also the New York Times Award for Notable Book of the Year, as did, by the way, his novel, The Crater. Uh, among his nonfiction books are No Quarter, The Battle of the Crater, 1864, uh, award-winning trilogy, uh, on the American frontier as well, Regeneration Through Violence, The Fatal Environment, and Gunfighter Nation. Uh, wonderful books, uh, I know, and those have done very well and uh, were the beginning of your writing, I think. Yes. yes. His latest book, is the one you're here for tonight, The Long Road to Antietam, How the Civil War Became a Revolution. Live Right Publishing, which is a division of Norton, it's 478 pages and with illustrations and maps and is $32.95. I uh, found this a fascinating book and also a wonderful read. Thank you. Uh, even though I told you ahead of time that I have trouble reading these things because yeah. I have to keep thinking of discussion questions, yeah. so I, I keep stopping every other paragraph to do that. But it, it really just flows. It's a oh, good read. It's a, the novelist in you comes out in this book. Uh, so as always, we ask... How did you come to this book? Why this book now? What brought you to this? And you might even start out by first telling us how you got into the Civil War to begin with. Well, yeah, the, the, the two are very closely connected. I, um, uh, Antietam is, the, is the, the battle that makes possible the Emancipation Proclamation. So if you think the Civil War is about slavery, then Antietam is really the, 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 the crisis moment that you want to focus on. And uh, my own interest in Civil War uh, goes back to when I was nine years old 1951, uh, my family took a uh, driving tour down through uh, uh, the South to visit relatives in Florida, stopping first at Gettysburg Battlefield, and uh, it, which was uh, really a kind of shrine to Abraham Lincoln and uh, to the whole notion of emancipation and freedom and so on. And then we went from this shrine to southern parks and battlefields with white and colored bathrooms. And uh, for weeks, I had this intense immersion in the landscape of Jim Crow and the meanness and the, the uh, poverty and the, just the, the, the nastiness of that, that system was forced on me at every turn. And at nine, I was, I was outraged by it. And I, I couldn't put together the country that I loved and, and the war and the, the president that I'd just been looking at, and this, this South. And what I realized was that the war hadn't ended, mm. that in some sense the matter of the Civil War had not been fully settled by the Civil War. And it's so it's interesting, it, by the yeah. way, at, at age nine, my parents took me down on a train trip uh -huh. and down to Florida. Yes. And I remember stopping, I think it was Georgia, uh, that uh, in the morning we woke yeah. up, we were in, you know, we were yeah. in sleeper cars, woke up, opened up, we were in a station, and for the first time, just yeah. like you, I was yeah. shocked. I saw outside there colored in white right. for everything. That's right. Shocking. That's right. And and if you cross the line in any way, I went in my ignorance went into the colored bathroom, not realizing what the sign meant, and got yelled at mm. by the people in the park that we uh, the uh, uh, Luray Caverns Park. That you we mean were in the colored? Uh, I went into the colored bathroom. Yeah. Any of them? Uh, uh, well, there was a guy in there who yelled at me also and said, "Get the hell out of here," mm. because you know. It was a dangerous thing for him, for me to be in there as well. And it was, I was nine years old and it was humiliating. 
and it was enraging, and I couldn't put together. I was a real, I, I was an am a real patriot, and I could not put together the uh, this idea of America as a land of freedom and equality, and this experience of racism. And, and because we had gone through Gettysburg, I it was like the whole history was there in my head, and I just, I've essentially spent the rest of my life filling in the gaps between then and and now. And so, uh, and Antietam. Uh, is partly produced by the occasion of the, the sesquicentennial, but I've been thinking about Antietam for um, 50 some odd years, um, and th that's why. You know, the, the book seemed for a bit to me to be a synthesis until I saw that you were taking that synthesis and moving it on uh, and finding things that we really had glossed over a bit. Yes. And uh, I got a larger appreciation for the dangers that Lincoln actually yeah. was in and the administration was. Yeah. Uh, how, did, how did that, we're going to get into that yes. in a great deal, but how did you get into, uh, how did this formulation begin with you that there was treason in the air? Yes. Well, I mean, there's, first of all, a wonderful Besides quote. Besides the South. Yes. There was, there was a, this wonderful quote from uh, Charles Francis Adams, Jr., uh, who arrives in Washington with reinforcements from the South uh, right after the Battle of Second Bull Run and right before the beginning of the Antietam campaign. And he says, the air in this city is thick with treason. Uh, we are ripe for a terrible panic, and I don't know what the outcome can possibly be. And he talks about speaking with army officers, McClellan's army of, uh, staff officers, who are accusing the President and the Secretary of War of treason. And of course, Stanton and the Lincoln's cabinet are accusing McClellan and his officers of treason. And you really get the sense that um, it, it's what I call a revolutionary crisis. It's a moment in the midst of a civil war following the Southern Rebellion when a whole range of things that are otherwise inconceivable to us were conceivable to people at the time, the notion that there might be a military coup. Let's step back a little bit. Uh, yeah. What, what did... Uh, how did Mc, uh, McClellan feel about uh, Lincoln? What were his views? Uh, he certainly felt that he was lifted above his station, yes. Lincoln. But what were the views that McClellan held of Lincoln the man? Well, it's, uh, it's partly a personal reaction. That is, that is, he feels that Lincoln is, is unjustly above him. He's a social snob. Uh, he's a would-be gentleman, really, McClellan. Um, and uh, he regards Lincoln as an ignorant man, as a stupid man, as a weak man. He calls him the original gorilla, a well-meaning baboon. And um, he thinks that if he can establish his own position as Lincoln's chief advisor, he can easily overawe him and essentially rule policy. But the second element of the clash between them, and the personalities are clearly there, is political because uh, McClellan is a uh, convinced, what he, he says he is um, a strong Democrat of the Stephen A. Douglas school. And he, he had, when he was a railroad president in Illinois before the war, he'd been a supporter of Douglas against Lincoln in the senatorial election and in the presidential election. And what that means, if you look actually at the politics of Stephen Douglas, uh, in the debates with Lincoln, he says, Lincoln, Lincoln's been saying, Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal. Douglas says no. He says, this government was created on the white basis by white people, for white people and their progeny, and that Negroes, Indians, and other lesser races have no place in that structure. And that is essentially McClellan's view. And, and though he's not, uh, he's not in love with slavery per se, uh, he sees slavery as essential to preserve white supremacy. And that's the basis of his conflict with Lincoln. He doesn't at first see that Lincoln is com a committed anti-slavery man. He thinks Lincoln is in the pocket of stronger personalities like Chase and Stanton and Seward. Um, so at first he doesn't, he doesn't see Lincoln as a radical. Uh, and that's a mistake. That's a misreading. Uh, but, uh, but it's Lincoln's susceptibility to radicalism that McClellan also despises. Well, susceptibility to change, yes. certainly. Yeah. Uh, radical or not, it was certainly radical at the time. Yes. What was McClellan's view of himself? 
he saw uh, he uh, he saw himself as, as his nickname, the young Napoleon. Um, uh, and uh, we have to remember that that the the nickname young Napoleon and the image of, of McClellan in his with his chest puffed out and his that it's not a neutral or merely historical reference. Uh, Napoleon the Third had overthrown the Second French Republic only ten years before, and the first Napoleon had overthrown the first French Republic. And the history of every republic, as as educated Americans well knew, going back to Caesar's Rome and Pericles Athens, every republic in history had succumbed to military dictatorship under the stress of civil war or civil strife within within a city state. And uh, Lincoln knew that and, and felt the peril that the country was in. And here's McClellan, the young Napoleon, and, and what he says is, um, people are asking me to become a dictator. And uh, it doesn't please me. He says to his wife, it, uh, it, does, it doesn't, if they, they say it as if it would please me, it wouldn't please me to do it. But if I became a dictator, if I were to do it, um, I would certainly commit, save, I would first save the country and then commit suicide to save, save her liberties. And uh, he keeps, over the years, he keeps coming back to this notion of the dictatorship, <coughs> leaving out the suicide, the suicide part. And, and uh, just to, to qualify that slightly, He's not the only one talking about dictatorship. Uh, Republicans are talking about it. Democrats are talking about it. And in the Southern Confederacy, they're also talking about it. And what they mean is that, that the Congress, Confederate or Union, would pass a law granting uh, control of military policy to a quote unquote dictator or general in chief and taking the, the effective commander in chief powers away from the president. And that's what McClellan was, was thinking that's about. That's how you that see point. a dictatorship in a republic. That's how you see a dictatorship in a republic. And then, presumably, when the war is over, the dictator gives the power back to the civil government, which, as Lincoln knows, and as most Americans should have known, isn't what tends to happen. You had mentioned, by the way, I wanted to ask you this, uh, <clears throat> that McClellan, of course, had been an executive at the Illinois Central yes. here in Illinois. Yeah. Uh, when Lincoln had to sue for his fee, was McClellan there at the time? Did, that they, was have, did uh, they have any? They didn't crossing? have any. I, they didn't have any interaction there, but they did on the um, um, during the Lincoln Douglas debates because McClellan sometimes traveled with uh, Douglas. Mm -hmm. But they, their acquaintance Lincoln. was really marginal. Mm -hmm. um, they might have met a few times. They didn't really know each other until McClellan came to Washington. No. Alan Guelzo, historian, yes, yes. has a blurb on, your, on the back of your dust jacket in which he says uh, that McClellan brought us, quote, to the brink of a treason greater than that contemplated by Benedict Arnold, unquote. Yes. Well, how great was McClellan's alleged treason since Benedict Arnold actually was a traitor? That's right. It's uh, what we have to, and here, this goes back to how, in a sense, how the book, how I came to this viewpoint in the book. What I wanted to do in the book was to trace was to tell the military story and to show how military decisions and political decisions work together on an almost day-by-day -day basis. Because as Clausewitz says, war is politics carried on by other means, and a civil war quintessentially is a political yeah. war. And as I was doing that, and as I was trying to, in a sense, put myself in the position of the decision maker, not knowing what the next day's result is going to be, but seeing only the possibilities that exist in the present moment. It occurred to me that with, with McClellan and his staff officers talking about marching on Washington, with the New York Herald encouraging the idea of a, of a military takeover at various points in all of this, um, that it's a live possibility and that it's something that when Lincoln makes decisions about McClellan, he has to have in mind his secretary, John Hay, for example, thinks that there is a McClellan conspiracy. Uh, Lincoln doesn't want to talk about it uh, because to talk about such a conspiracy in the midst of civil war is itself an extraordinarily dangerous thing to do. And so what you have to, you have to, you have to see, and, and, and historians have not seen that, I think, because they know it didn't happen. And therefore, they're understanding of what could have happened is simply, well, it couldn't have happened. 
because it didn't happen. But n the actors didn't know that. And what you have is a situation in which, uh, in, let's say in, by the end of uh, August, beginning of September, Confederate Army is at the gates of Washington. It's in, after more than a year of a civil war that has fractured the constitutional order. Um, you've got a general who commands the army that defends the capital, whose staff officers are accusing the president and his advisors of treason, of betraying the Constitution, and talking about, as they said, changing front on Washington. And you have the, the uh, members of the cabinet, uh, Chase and Stanton, saying McClellan is a traitor, and Chase says he ought to be shot. Uh, it seems to me that that's, that's a very, very perilous moment in which an overenthusiastic staff officer could have precipitated a real crisis.